Well, hi again, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Inside Furman Athletics. I am the voice of the Paladins, Dan Scott. Very, very happy to be back with you for another week and kind of getting back into a routine again after Christmas break. We did one show and then had Snowmageddon for the Upstate, and now we've this is two weeks in a row, so we may be getting some kind of rhythm. Whether the quality improves or not, we'll let you be the judge of that. This is our monthly visit with Athletic Director Jason Donnelly, who is here, and we also get to introduce you to the new women's lacrosse coach here at Furman Kirkland Lewis. How well, are Dan, you? Dan, before we do that, I oh, think okay. we need to talk about a, a monumental event that's taking place for you. So, uh -oh. so Dan, it's, it's been a great winter. Uh, you've been everywhere. You've been traveling basketball nonstop, but sometimes I've been amazed by some of the things that you've done and some of the things you've, the way you've traveled and the way you've broadcast our program. But uh, I do want to bring to the, the public's attention the excitement that I would normally say for you know a wedding or a child, but your enthusiasm for your Cincinnati ah, Bengals. Yes. <laughs> and, and I share with you, I wish that Coach Weiss was here, and I remember that, that game vividly in Stanford Jennings and the icky shuffle and everything about it. Uh, but I do want to give you the opportunity, Dan, to talk about – we'll get off the Paladins for a second talk a little bit about the Cincinnati Bengals. Nobody will ever accuse me of being a bandwagon fan. Uh, I have been a, uh, a Cincinnati Reds and Bengals fan my entire life. Went through uh, from 1991 through 2005 without a winning season. Mm -hmm. uh, playoffs five straight years, going back a few years, never had a playoff win. So, uh, yeah, first time in 33 years that they've been to the Super Bowl. I, I got a little excited. You know, there were a couple of times if I'd have had the old foam brick, I would have thrown at the television <laughs> on Saturday. But uh, that's the way it works. But, but having developed the relationship that, that I was fortunate to do uh, with Sam Weiss going back, probably uh, he and I met around 2002, 2003, and, and struck up a friendship. Just to put it in context, Jason, when I was a senior in high school, Sam became the Bengals head coach. So the guy was the head coach of my favorite NFL team. Never dreamed that I would develop into, a, you know, have a friendship with him. And he did radio shows with me all the time. Um, and, and unfortunately, we, we lost him a little over a year ago. So I, I just couldn't help but think, man, it would have been great if Sam would have been here to see this. Yeah, and sometimes in these things, too, I thought about Coach Weish as well. And for me, taking this job, one of my greatest honors and pleasures was the opportunity to spend some time with mm -hmm. him. And um, you know, not, not even knowing the Furman connection, knowing the NFL connection. Yeah. And the gentleman that he, that he is, the comedian that he was, oh, the, um, the family man, everything. And, and sometimes I'm a big believer in a little bit of faith, and there may be a little bit of Coach Weish sprinkled on the season, but it's been really special. But – uh, what I wanted the public to know is um, similar to the Cincinnati school system. We're, we're going to give Dan Scott the day off after the Super Bowl, <laughs> and for his wife, it's 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 Valentine's Day. So so Dan could go twice here. I mean, Dan, Dan could win a Super Bowl on the 13th, have a day off on the 14th, yeah. spend some time with his family. But I think this is a great thing for the Cincinnati, city of Cincinnati, and it's also a great thing for our beloved Dan Scott. As long as I'm back to do. Inside Furman Athletics on the 15th and at Western Carolina on the 16th. Let's go. Right? Yeah. I, I do want to say this since, since we brought up Coach Weish. Um, we, we were fortunate to get three more years with Sam because of the, the heart transplant that he was a recipient of. And, and after that, he became, as you might imagine, a huge proponent of organ transplant, organ donation. So I would just say that as a Furman fan or as any other fan, NFL, whatever it is, if you'd like to honor Sam's memory, next time you go fill out your driver's license to renew, check that organ donor box. I did it a number of years ago. So did my wife well before Sam had the transplant. But what a great way it would be to honor his memory is to, to help carry that legacy on that, that gave us an extra three years with him. And... Um, and we'll see what happens in the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks. And, Dan, I'll second that as well. And, and if we can transition at this point now, um, I want to use this as an opportunity uh, because it was a little bit of a – it was a challenging process when you do this in semester. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily get the fanfare or the ability to go through this process that you would be earlier in the year. Um, but I want to use this as the official opportunity to introduce our new women's lacrosse head coach, Kirkland Lewis, uh, who's been on the job now. We've made the announcement. She's been – 
doing a great job. But yeah, we Dan, brought I, we brought her up here. We might as well let her talk. Let's right? do it. <laughs> you know, I'll just let you guys catch up. And uh, <laughs> I think your day off after the Super Bowl could be like a day of celebration or mourning, depending well, e- how the day goes. Either way, <laughs> yeah. right at that at this juncture, I, I don't gamble. But at this juncture, from where they've come in the last two years, I'm playing with house money. Okay. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm good. Uh, you and I were talking before Jason got up here before we started the the recording. Um, you're becoming pretty good uh, at packing and unpacking boxes, aren't you? I am, yes. Two moves in, you know, six months. And, uh, you know, I have a couple stragglers. I was telling you that I'm not completely settled, but I feel I can just keep them in the closet and move on from, from there. It's kind of a, a lost cause with the last two boxes. <laughs> well, how does, how does it feel for you? It feels great. It's been a whirlwind in the best way to kind of get the opportunity and then to get here in December and meet the team before they left for winter break and to have a clinic and meet recruits and have commits. And now we're prepping for season and, you know, we're less than two weeks out. So it's been it's been awesome. And to have, you know, just be welcomed by the Furman Athletic Department, even some faculty members have reached out. It's been a really, you know, more than I thought it would be coming in mid-semester when there's so many other things going on. So it's been awesome. And one of the things I prepared you for, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the hiring process with you as well, was just this incredible enthusiasm and passion from your team in terms of who they are. But tell us a little bit about the, the team and the connection you have with them. Yeah, I mean, they just were so ready, I think, to turn a new page, and they were welcoming they were ready for change to be challenged and they're just so self-motivated the way they were able to carry the freshmen and take them under their wings in the fall without really any coach supervision and continue to work and they still have high goals of winning the conference and so they've just been you know phenomenal in how they carry themselves and their expectations of themselves and just how they work has been really awesome and we're starting our first full week of practice so we're, we're getting into the grind now. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because throughout the fall, being up here, uh, you know, two, three, four days a week, depending on what was going on, it, it was not uncommon to be looking down there and seeing the lacrosse team warming oh, up, yeah. practicing, doing drills, working out on their own because yep. there were no coaches here on campus. That's got to speak to the, the dedication of the players that you inherited when you came in here? Absolutely. It's something I think really made me feel confident coming into the position where that the students really want this and they really chose Furman Athletics at the end of the day. So I think that that gives us a really unique piece that not all teams have is that they had the opportunity to go elsewhere and they really believe in what they can do here with this team. And so, I mean, they still do it. I'll be in my office and I see them out on the grass fields just throwing around, doing footwork and they really, really want this, and they're actually putting in the work to, to be successful. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll second that, too. I, it's a really unique feature of this team is the maturity of their leadership and the commitment <laughs> of the team and the culture. Um, what we went through was a bit unusual. Um, Rachel Witten did a phenomenal job of building a program uh, from scratch, getting it off the ground and getting everything started, getting all the blocks in place to be successful, and we're incredibly thankful for her on that. Uh, the timing, um, the first day of classes with the change was, was a lot. It was something that we didn't expect at that point. Um, you're obviously always prepared to go into a coaching search at any point, uh, but the timing is not ideal. You know, The timing is one of those things because a coach is really looking after a season to make a move. They're looking to make a move in the summer, and then when you get back. And the, we had weekly meetings uh, with the team <laughs> and weekly meetings with the leadership. And uh, it, and I really enjoyed, and I, I have a great relationship with them before this, but I really enjoyed getting to know them uh, on more of a personal level. But one of the things that really blew me away was their commitment to this hiring process. Yeah, um, we, we were very clear and transparent with them from the beginning. They were actively involved. Um, and we were very fortunate that Kirkland emerged early in the process, and um, our staff was talking to her, and they kept saying to me, we really want to get Kirkland <laughs> We just don't know if we can get her. And and they meant that in a really good way because Kirkland was going through a process where she'd been a head coach and she just moved to Bucknell to be a part of that program there. And part of for her was saying, I just made this move. It's tough timing. Um, But we went through the process with the team. We'd gotten to a point in the process that we really were ready to make a hard push, to make a push on the coach. And we decided to re-engage the process with some prospects. And we wound up bringing some phenomenal prospects to campus, all of which could very easily be the head coach. But Kirkland, through that process, emerged. We were so fortunate. Um, you know, it was as close to unanimous as it gets, if not unanimous. 
Um, but the impact that she made with our student athletes, the connection she made from the, the day, day one, the first meeting, all the different things that went through it. So I'm very thankful to our student athletes for supporting us in the process. Absolutely. But they got the coach they wanted, which how do you feel about that when you're getting to know them in that process? It feels really – it's just like an honor, I think, to have athletes really care enough to shift and sift through so many different candidates and feel – a connection and really understand my values and philosophies. And I understand the same thing coming from their end, what their goals are and their values. And so it was just really, it's been really awesome to each day form new connections, but also the messaging has been so consistent in what we believe we can do and what we want to do and how we can get there. So it's been awesome. And the question is going to be, will they still want you after the first full week of practice? Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, we'll, you know, I'm happy we're doing this today, early in the week. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I'll, I'll answer that question for you because I've had a chance to talk to them. Um, their commitment to excellence is off the charts. Yeah. They want it. They part of their criteria. We we had again excellent candidates. They wanted a candidate that was going to understand them. That was really important to them. They wanted someone who was going to embrace their culture. Mm -hmm. So Kirkland, as a former player, as a former head coach, and someone that just is a culture driven person, totally got it. Yeah. And then the other part they wanted, they're like, <laughs> we want a coach that's going to can push us enough and believe in us to win championships. And I've talked to you about this. I mean, it, it, it came back to me consistently. The seniors like, we're here to win. We're right. here to win this year. We're here to win right now. They went 6-0 in the fall. They believe in what they can do. Uh, Hannah D., one of, our, the, she, one of our juniors, I mean, she just said to me, she goes, I want a coach that believes we can beat anyone. You oh, know, that, yeah. that will schedule that way, that will compete that way, that will recruit that way. Um, and our underclassmen are just incredibly fun and energetic and talented. Um, but it's also, you know, what I want also publicly to know, we're going through a little bit of a rebuild. You know, anytime Absolutely. that you go through a, a transition in coaching, like you've got a great core and mm -hmm. you can win this year. We're going to talk about that Absolutely. in a second. But you're also building. So what, what's your building process look like? A lot of work you've been doing to build the program. Yeah, it's really just getting the word out of really about who Furman lacrosse is moving forward mm -hmm. and what we're about and trying to find student athletes that fall in alignment with that. So um, you know, it's really the 2023 class, the juniors right now that we're going after and having those connections with. And it's it's a lot of talking, a lot of visits, but really making sure for me, it's getting the right student athletes that are choosing firm and academics, firm and lacrosse, and also believing that they can positively impact the program in their first year. Mm -hmm. They want them to have confidence, a little bit of swag to come in and, and really because the Big South Conference is really competitive. So you can't come in thinking oh, I just want to play lacrosse and kind of float through. You have to come in thinking, I know I can help this program win, and this is how I'm going to do that. Well, if you want swag, let's just go beat North Carolina, the number two I team mean, in the country, to open 16th. the season, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and <laughs> it's funny you mentioned HD. She is so hardcore, and I love it because she – that was something in our individual meeting that we talked about was like, you have to know that I want to beat everyone, and I know we can. And I'm like, yeah, we can. Let's go. Yeah. You know, we're, we scheduled really tough, and – we know that we can compete with all the teams in our non-conference. Non and that's part of our mentality at Furman, and I love that you embraced it because when you told me we're playing North Carolina, I was like, I love it. You know, yeah. and, and we're going right after it right away. Um, and, you know, we, we've got a smaller roster right now. I mean, part of Kirkland's challenge is to rebuild a roster just in terms of numbers. But um, this group is talented enough to win right off the bat, and they're going Absolutely. into a conference that has been dominated by High Point. Mm -hmm. um, part of the conversation also is about the Big South. You know, one of the things that – Athletic directors, we agreed to. We wanted to go into a conference that fit what we were. Right. We felt like the Big South, in terms of lacrosse, fit the type of programs that we are. This would be us, Wofford, Mercer, joining a, a league that we think is really good. But we're going to the Big South to compete to win the championship in that conference. But we also know that High Point in that league has historically been the league, but league champion. But what do you think about the Big South? Because this is new, not just for you, but for right. Furman entering the yeah. Big South. Yeah, I think the Big South is it's up for grabs. There's a lot of new coaches in the Big South. Um, I think the fifth year, COVID year, has changed a lot of things where players end up and where they're going. The transfer portal has been, you know, booming with players. But I really do think it's, you know, being at the top, staying there, and having change up is great. And for us, the top two teams are teams that we want to pick off right away. In Mercer, there's, yep. you know, obviously some some – Heated rivalry. Heated rivalry <laughs> there, and we want to, you know, didn't give take them you, some didn't payback. It didn't take you long to figure that no, out, No, it, it didn't. It didn't. Um, <laughs> and so we know what we're working to, and so it's kind of always looking at the top and making sure that we continue to compete with everyone else, but knowing overall that's, that's who we have to beat. 
in, in, in looking at your bio, um, and I'm, I'm sure this is just coincidence, but it's funny how these things work out. You are the second ever women's lacrosse coach here at yes. Furman. When you were at D3 Whitman, yes. you were the second ever women's lacrosse coach mm -hmm. there as well. What lessons did you pick up from that experience that translate into this job, if anything does? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, is it takes time. Um, when I went into Whitman, I think I came in, you know, you just get so excited when you get your first head coaching opportunity and you want to do things your way. And that's the way it is. And it's that creates a, a separation, I think, and it makes the transition harder. So for me, it's really collaborating a little bit more with student athletes now understanding that I have final say, but I don't want to just tear everything away and try to implement things. It's making sure you're implementing things that fit personnel and understanding how long it actually takes to grow a culture um, and move in your own vision. And the other thing at Whitman, two of the three years you were the head coach there, you were the only coach there, right? Yes, indeed. So <laughs> how'd, that, um, how'd that work out for you? I learned a lot on the fly <laughs> and I knew how to do everything under the sun that had to deal with my program. And so I think that really helped me in ways that I didn't know at the time, just understand the office part of coaching mm -hmm. and then really uh, time management for sure of just balancing everything and making sure nothing falls through the cracks. I think some of the things that really resonated with us during the interview process also is we, we did a lot of outreach to people in the mm -hmm. lacrosse community to talk about coaches and names started to become consistent. You know, people would talk about these are the rising coaches in this profession. These, this is the next generation. That's what I really thought was, was exciting about Kirkland is that Kirkland's background as a student athlete, Kirkland's background as a coach, <laughs> Kirkland's background as a leader, Kirkland's personality. You know, when, when we, we brought Kirkland, she just wowed everybody. And, and part of what I'm really excited about, um, to your point, Dana, we, the, the foundation's been laid. So there's a degree of that that's been put in place. Mm -hmm. And then there's so much that we want to do. You know, like it's really exciting for me yeah. to look out over the brand new turf field and you got the lines down. We're ready to compete. We're investing in facilities. We've got Absolutely. a plan for fundraising. We've yep. got a plan to grow the program. Um, all these different things that are in place that we want to do, but the same competitive level is there. Um, but Kirkland has really resonated in that process in terms of who she is. So part of what I'm excited about is for more people in the Furman family to get to know Kirkland and to really – have a chance to resonate. Kirkland came to an event we had. Jackie Carson was hosting an event downtown. And um, I was trying to meet with all the candidates for dinner and spend time the night before they got their interview going. And I said, why don't you have Kirkland come by? And Kirkland met people that evening. They're like, wow, this is, this is our next coach potentially. And then she just raved everybody, VPs and outside community as well. Um, part, I think, some of the questions people are going to have is your style of play, you know, the type of things that you mm -hmm. want to do or – you know, what's some of your coaching style? What is, what's some of the ways that you want to attack the game in, in, in the Big South as a part of Firm of the Cross? Yeah, I think for offensively, I'd like us to really be a balanced attack. And it sounds, you know, if you know lacrosse at all, it sounds very cliche, but really making sure that all seven people on attack can produce offensive stats and really making sure that they are being not just complementary but a threat. And then defensively, we really have implemented a, a great um, – aggressive, high-pressure defense, and we just have so many athletic players that we can do that. So it's been really nice to put something in that's high energy off the bat. We want to create chaos and really be the deterrent on what teams can do offensively. And then offensively, it's pushing the pace using that same athleticism, but just being super smart and clean. Um, so it's been looking great so far, but um, it's really going to be just being very aggressive in what we do and making sure that we're intentional and efficient in how we. As, as she's talking here, you know, if you close your eyes, she could be talking about Bob Ritchie's basketball yes. team because, because, <laughs> because everybody on the floor needs to be a threat to score. And, and, and what has fueled this run they've been on now? They're now the number one defensive team right? statistically in the Southern Conference yes. with, with, with playing you know pressure man to man defense. There's so, very, so there are very some correlations there, right? Oh, they're, oh they, yeah. They are aggressive. They, before we hired Kirkland at one point, they wanted to challenge the men's basketball team to a pickup game. You know? <laughs> basketball and I don't even know if this got to you already but I did talk to coach Richie about this yesterday uh, your team ran into coach Richie Rich, he, it did he, he so Bob I love I was just with Bob um, he's making the rounds on campus he's going to lunch he's going to cafeteria every day this week to drum up support for the, yeah. for the attendance of the games and um, he ran into Kirkland's team and Kirkland is practicing in the in the evenings uh, afternoons after classes yes but on Wednesday we have a conflict because we've got a home game 
<laughs> on campus. We've got practice, and this is one of your early coaching decisions. <laughs> they want – the coach, they want their coach to adjust their practice time so they can get to the game as well. Yeah. I have no idea where you landed and, on this. And decision. they really like, you know, tried to softball it to me. They sent me a picture with Coach Richie and all of them <laughs> smiling and said he invited us personally, invited us to the game. And I'm like, we practice six to eight. What are you guys yeah. talking about? Exactly. <laughs> and then same thing, weekends at the well. This weekend we have a scrimmage at noon, and the game's going on at noon. And I think that you know they're basketball's biggest fans, so they're kind of trying to. Hey, what? Well, we think I think my class might end early. I think we can get out. I'm like, okay, we'll we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. No <laughs> promises, right? That. No promises. And I love that, and it's a part of the culture that we want to have is we want to support each other, um, and we've noticed that commitment from the other teams to supporting yeah. each other. And you you'll feel that in your games. You know, it's it's one of the things that really resonates with me is that when we go to athletic competitions on our campus, the student athletes come out to support each yeah. other and. Whether it's soccer, or lacrosse, or football, basketball, what what really warms my heart is when they come out to golf. I mean, it, yeah. there's never anyone at a golf outing, but when our student athletes come out to a golf match to watch them tee off, I think it's really cool. But uh, Kirkland, we're so excited you're here. A l- l- little plug here also for your student athletes. Sure. You know who's really stood out to you. And if you're looking at who's playing well, and yeah, I know all of them are making an impact. But what's really stood out to you on the student athlete side? I think for I'll go class by class. The senior class as a whole has been great and just really adjusting to new systems and saying, okay, we've, this is what we used to do. This is what did, didn't work. And just going and doing what they do best, doing that consistently. Junior class, I think obviously standouts are Meg Beal and Hannah Dentino. They are just a hundred thousand percent all the time from stick work all the way to the end. They just give it all, they're all, and they have such great mentalities the sophomore class, I think Caitlin Sousa stands out. She is just so solid defensively and is always wanting to get better. And then our freshman class, I think all of them just have great sparks. And like you said, they, they're a very big personality class, and but they're really able to dial in and focus, and they all want to get better so badly. So it's been great to see. Um, you know, just the, the depth we have even in a smaller roster. When I think of the freshman class, I think of Molly. I mean, Molly, oh, yeah. Molly's a dominant personality <laughs> and maybe the most energetic freshman I've ever I, seen in yeah. college athletics. Well, She's and, my and, little ball of sunshine. And, and to kind of bring it back full circle, you were talking about my Bengals a moment ago. The, the, uh, Joe Burrow had a, a quote, uh, I think after they won the first playoff game against the Raiders, somebody was talking about what they had done, you know, first playoff win since 1991. And he said, you know, we're just a bunch of young guys, and right now we don't know what we don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the way it is with a talented yeah. group of freshmen that yep. can come in and I don't want to say have an accidental impact, but but it can have an impact because they don't know what they don't know, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and they just, they're sponges. So you give them something, and they just go out and they try to replicate it, and they're always like, is that what, it, what you meant? Is it, They come in, they want to watch more film on practice, and so – it is. They don't. They don't know what they don't know, and I think that that's great because they want to learn, and it can be what we're trying to do right now. All right. So as we get set to wrap up this first portion, uh, you open up on the road at number two North Carolina on yes. February the sixteenth. Yes. And then you've got a break, and your next game is the home opener, which is here March fifth yes. at Palina Stadium against Elon. Yeah. So you get to break it out for the home team for the first time. Yeah, we're gonna. Uh, you know. Just hit the road, I think, right away, and we're looking at it as it only gets easier from there, and our non-conference slate really will prepare us for conference games. Um, but I think having our first home game will be really exciting, and just we're doing a lot of things for the senior class and putting it all out there for them and getting them the championship they've been so close to. But this season is going to be really awesome, and it's going to be challenging, but that's kind of how season goes. Yeah, and this is going to be a great opportunity. You got a, you got a mix of veterans that are experienced and competed at a high high level. You got an influx of young talent. You got a new program, and you got a new league. So mm-hmm. there's so many different things that are variables that are going to be a part of this. And we're just so excited to have your leadership be a part of this. Thank you. Um, I think Kirkland's a, a rising star in this profession. I've got great optimism in terms of where she's headed and what she's going to do. And also, it, you know, we're in a transition point with the program in terms of what we're building into. So we're excited about the opportunities, but. Um, between Kirkland and Stacy with softball, there's a lot of exciting new energy yeah. this spring that this you're going to see from an athletics. But good luck to you with everything. Thank you so much. And I have to say this as, as we wrap up this portion of it, your broadcaster's dream, because I told you, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and you've taken us about 30. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so good. You, you, you like it. 
You, you, you like I'll do it. what I can. Kirkland, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. That is Kirkland Lewis. She is the uh, new lacrosse coach here for the uh, Furman Women's Lacrosse Program. A couple of things to look at before we transition uh, into the second half with Jason. First of all, just a short time before we started recording this on uh, Tuesday afternoon, the uh, Furman football schedule for the fall was officially released. And uh, you can see it on your screen there. Going to open up with a Thursday night gig against North Greenville before going to Clemson and then at ETSU and at Charleston Southern. So three consecutive road games after the North Greenville game to uh, open up the schedule. You can see the rest of it there. Uh, home games this year against uh, North Greenville on that Thursday night and then league games against Samford, Western Carolina, Chattanooga and close out the regular season against Wofford. And then uh, with the boss being in here, we want to make sure we play Huckster a little bit here and remind you that there are still plenty of tickets available for the remaining two weekend at the well basketball games, the 5th and the 19th. Coming up, in fact, this weekend against UNCG at noon. And then uh, two weeks after that, closing out the weekend at the well with Wofford downtown. So you can see that on your screen. And then this is the uh, other home games that are coming up immediately here at Timmins Arena. Citadel tomorrow night. And then you see the women's schedule there as well. So uh, give you an opportunity to, to uh, get your tickets and get ready to roll for uh, – more great Furman basketball, including the two remaining weekend at the Well games. And Dan, I think that's really well said. It's a really good, you know, kind of segue as we head into the next half of this. Is that um, we we need your support, uh, you know, Paladin and family. We we need everybody here on Wednesday. We got a huge game for our men's basketball program this Saturday as well downtown at the Well. Uh, it's been really interesting for us as we watch how things are transpiring with regards to COVID or. or uh, different challenges you have coming back. We've watched other programs as well uh, in terms of where they're at. Uh, a lot of our energy is shifting towards this February 9th game against Wofford downtown. A lot of the group work we do for the well, it's almost been unanimous. That's, that's where people are driving their energy. So one of the questions that I, that I noticed that you had was about do we expect to pack the well and have that full capacity game that we had two years ago when we played Wofford downtown, and that's exactly where this is trending. Uh, God willing, if, if health continues to improve and, and numbers in our uh, area continue to improve, yes. Um, I'd say in the meantime, our ask of you as fans is we need your support as best you can on, on Wednesday night uh, in, in Timmins and also this weekend downtown when we play UNCG. Those are the two points of emphasis we have for this week. But um, I hope everyone enjoyed getting to meet Kirkland. Mm -hmm. You know, For me, that was really enjoyable. I've had a chance to spend a lot of time with her and really excited about her. And one of the things that we got is questions along the way. Um, when you go through a coaching transition, and we had a great coach that had built a program, and it just was her time to make a move. When the timing is not ideal in a search, the timing is, is ideal for a search after a season in the summertime when your student athletes aren't on campus. Uh, but when you have your student athletes on campus and you got your core, um, I, I stared with them from, from day one. I said, guys, I'm not going to rush this decision. We are going to take our time to find the best coach for you and the best coach for you, not for just for this year, but for the next several years as we look ahead to the program. You want to be able to get someone that you can build with, someone that's got the right integrity, someone that's got the right personality, someone that embraces uh, the firm and opportunities and the challenges that go with that. Uh, but going through the process with, with, with our coaching staff, you know, the first thing you do um, when you're looking at this is you look from within, and you look at what you have and where you stand. And then the next step you take is you look at who do you want to have be a part of this. And we're so fortunate that Kirkland – why not being that person? And it, and it took some time to get to that process in terms of the rebuilding process that we have within lacrosse, and we, we're aware of that. But super excited. She's been on the job for several months now. Has put a staff together, has practices, workouts, had a chance to watch her. And um, I would encourage everyone to come out and, and check out the team and support her. But it's going to be an exciting run for her as she builds a roster and she builds recruiting uh, with a great senior class. The other thing, too, that's an interesting dynamic is playing in the Big South. You know, we've got some rivalries that are built in. Uh, with Wofford, with Mercer, that we've competed against in the Southern Conference. They're coming with us. Uh, we all agreed to make this decision together. And uh, we're excited to go into the Big South. And we know there there's definitely a bullseye and high point in terms of the success they've had and the infrastructure that they've built. And we're going to work towards overcoming high point in that league in terms of them being by far the favorite in that league. Uh, but we understand it. We're excited to take it on. So we're excited. Um, the other thing, Dan, I want to talk about, um, you and I mentioned, was just talk a little bit last year before we move into this year. 
Uh, last year was a phenomenal year for Furman Athletics. Um, recently sent out a letter to our community just to say thank you uh, to all of you for supporting uh, the efforts that we had with our programs and our teams. Uh, as an administration, we couldn't be prouder. You know, we look at the different values that we have, uh, but the emphasis on health and safety and a not have a game lost to COVID for a positive test by our team says so much about our community. Um, great championship performances on the field. You know, winning the Commissioner Cup was a, was a big deal. Uh, it's been a first time in a long time for us to do that. And narrowly uh, losing the German Cup by, by literally maybe a putt um, in, in terms of how close that margin was in terms of the women's uh, sports as well. But it was a phenomenal year. Mm -hmm. you know, great accomplishments academically, great accomplishments in fundraising, great accomplish accomplishments in getting our football program back on the field with attendance. And we're really striving to get back to normal. You know, like I, I, all of us thought at this point, you know, you think about we're in 2022, some of these challenges we had with COVID would be behind us, and we're still going through that a little bit to a degree with policies and things we've got to do to make sure we operate safely. Uh, but optimistic, excited, and, and really fully engaged in terms of where we are in 2022. Well, it's just <clears throat> it continues to be uh, – from from behind the scenes, I mean, the, you know, the public sees what the public sees, and sometimes I'm sure they have questions about why certain things happen. As a matter of fact, we got a long list of them here. Yeah, but I don't looking know forward to going through. I them. don't know that we're going to yeah. get through all of them today, but uh, you know, <clears throat> from behind the scenes, seeing uh, everything from from the care that goes into the athletes to the protection and the prevention that our facilities people have gone through, that Elaine and the sports medicine people have gone through, uh, and, and the way that people here on campus have responded to that so we can continue to provide uh, a, a, a regularly scheduled athletic competition for our athletes and fans. And, and even to the point, I was laughing with one of the, uh, the EPI folks in, in Timmins a couple of weeks ago, because of the surge in, in the Omicron virus uh, or variant of the virus, uh, we went back to mandatory masks. And they're walking around. I said, you, you know, like you're like at the Masters, a golf tournament with the quiet please yeah. signs. But now they're walking around with, you know, mask required signs just as a way to remind people that, hey, something we've got to put up with right now in order to get through this little surge. Yeah, and that's that's been a necessary thing that we've had to do to support our community, to support our campus. And uh, sometimes if you're a fan looking at it, you might say, well, why do you need to do all these things? Well, at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that the academic enterprise is able to operate the way that they need to for us to have the curriculum that we need and be able to have faculty and staff and students safe on our campus. And despite the challenges, I think as you go through it, we're trending in where the direction we want to be, which is getting back to the point of not having to worry about restrictions that take place and things that go on around it. But we do appreciate everyone's support in terms of wearing masks because – the alternative, the alternative is, is to not have fans, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a place that we don't want to go to where um, wearing a mask, it, to me, is, is a minor inconvenience for the opportunity to be a part of a game, and we appreciate that support. The other thing I want to mention is both of our teams are having a great year, you know, and if you look at the success that our men's basketball team is having, um, not just in our conference but nationally, the fact that they're leading the nation in three-pointers, um, the work that they're doing, <laughs> sharing the ball, the defensive play. I mean, Bob Ritchie's got that team playing at a high, high level. Uh, which is exactly where he wants it to be and where we're trending and where we're going. Um, the good thing, too, is the league is really strong, you know, and, and that bodes well relative to where we are. Uh, so a lot of the positioning you're looking at in season is you want to play a competitive non-conference season. And Bob went out and did that. He took some chances knowing you're not going to win as many games, but he went out and played a more competitive field in the non-conference. The league has played a more competitive field in the non-conference so therefore, our net scores when we're talking about rankings are actually trending higher because our league is the ninth-ranked league in the country, and it's really only behind these power conferences in the, in the country relative to where we stand. So there's been a lot of really strong improvements in terms of where we are and what we need to do in the league. Things line up really well for us moving forward. We've got a number of different weekend games that are coming up, uh, and we feel like we're really in the driver's seat relative to where we are. And us in Chattanooga and that game coming up on the 12th is going to be a huge game if both of us can continue to maintain the success that we have. Equally uh, impressive is Jackie Carson with the work that she's been doing. Mm -hmm. For Jackie to go down with her team and get a win at Mercer was such a huge accomplishment, knowing what she's up against and what she's building. Uh, such a great accomplishment for a team. And then for her to come back and to win two games this weekend. So, um, you know, all of our thoughts and energy are behind supporting these two teams during the winter. Um, you got winter track and field, which kind of takes care of itself the way that it operates in, in the winter sports. Uh, but these two teams, in terms of what we're doing and where we're going, 
um, and getting the energy behind them and getting prepared for March. You know, the conversations we're having now that we're going to share with the public is information about the conference tournament and getting ready for that NCAA tournament. And nothing would make the Furman family prouder. Uh, Furman alumni, Furman coaches, Furman students, then if we can be sitting there on Selection Sunday and announcing both of our teams having a chance to be yep. in the NCAA tournament. And as of right now, today, they both do, um, which is really, really encouraging and exactly where we want to be in terms of uh, March Madness. Before we get into the questions, you also wanted to touch uh, a bit on an update where the NCAA Constitution is concerned. Yeah, I, I wanted to share this because I think it's important for the public to know, and I don't think it's um, – necessarily gotten enough attention, um, uh, maybe amongst the Furman community or maybe even nationally, but it's really important to know that the university, that the NCAA is going through a process right now. They're going through an NCAA constitutional reform reformation where they're beginning to look at what does the constitution for the NCAA look like. And this is a result of a number of different things that you might have saw the legislation changes in 2021. And this is everything from an increase in the transfer portal to name, image, and likeness um, to legislation that involves different cases that the NCA has been involved in. Uh, but it's really important for our public to keep track of where this is all going because a lot of us now are in the passenger seat with regards to this process. This process is being taken place with NCA leadership, with NCA conference officials, um, with different representatives that are part of it. Uh, but they're talking about reforming the NCA at whole in terms of all the different things that impact Division One athletics, Division Two athletics, Division Three athletics, um, and we've positioned ourselves really well for success moving forward. But this has a chance to have landscape changes across the board that could come up as early as this summer um, that we're talking about with our other peers at other institutions that we're talking about with the conferences. Uh, but we're keeping a keen eye on this. But this is a really interesting time uh, in the in the history of the NCA. I mean, they, they've gone through this before, but I don't think it's ever gone through with the chance to be so far-reaching and changing and I think a lot, at the end of the day, a lot of this involves Power Five football. Mm -hmm. You know, um, people can say different things. They can say it's this. They can say it's that. It's it's not. It's Power Five football. Um, and what does that look like for the Power Five, for the Group of Five, for FCS, for all of us? Um, and it's something we're keeping a close eye on. And it's something that definitely has an impact in terms of where things go. Um, the best case scenario, is, and and I think our commissioner says it really well, is that you keep everything underneath the same. Big top, you know, keep everything working the same way when it comes to championships in terms of different things. But I do think it's important for the public to be aware that this process is going on because it's certainly being talked about by, by NCAA officials, by athletic directors, by conferences. It's a hot topic. So I think that's a big thing that we'll know more about as it plays out and we head into the summer. All right, you want to get into some of these questions? Yeah, let's do it. I think the other thing, too, we got to give a shout-out to Clint Dempsey. Yeah, I've got, the, got him in my notes. <laughs> I mean, Hall of Famer. Um, you know, it just speaks again to the excellence of Furman. Um, there's so many different people you can talk about in different sports. You know, one of the things we're looking forward to doing is is honoring Natalie, Natalie Srinivasan is going to come back and be honored uh, this February. We've got uh, Cindy Davis and Brad Faxon coming back. We're opening a building with them. You know, we're we're doing all this great stuff that's taking place. We've got some of our donors that we're honoring as early as this weekend, um, and our trustees coming through in the month of February. Um, but Clint Dempsey, you know, for have that not just national, but international mm -hmm. um, Hall of Fame, you know, to, for him to be recognized that way. Uh, what an honor for, for Furman Soccer. What an honor for Doug Allison. Um, but congratulations to Clint. we got to give him the shout-out on that. It's pretty unbelievable. Yeah, it'd be nice if Doug could recruit a few more of those type athletes, wouldn't it? He's working on it. You know, <laughs> he, he is definitely doing it. And, and Doug is as competitive as they come, but we're really proud of Clint and really thankful for everything he's done for Furman. You know, Doug knows one baseball trivia fact. What is that? The the person who invented the catcher's mitt. Okay. Doug Allison. Doug Allison? Yes. Not our Doug Allison. No, okay. no, no. no. Good. Long, Good. long time ago. Good. Uh, all right, let's get to some of this stuff. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can. I don't know we'll get through the whole list, but you're coming back next month. So uh, if we have to hold over, we will. Um, the first question is about uh, improvements uh, at Timmins to raise the quality of the arena and some of the other things that are going on. They just want to know if there are any updates that can be shared publicly regarding next phases in the process. Yeah, great question. Um, so if, if you don't know already, uh, we just spent in the past year making improvements to what we would call phase one of the existing plan that we have to renovate Timmins Arena. Um, the offices, the locker rooms, the film, room, film rooms are all in progress and getting done. I believe members of the Round Ball Club are coming in this week to check those things out in person. Um, couldn't be prouder of the way that process went through for both Bob and Jackie and their programs. They've come out first class, uh, very thankful to our architects, our designers, our construction crew, our campus 
for the way that they've supported that project. So that, that really is phase one of what we're working on. Phase two is then working with the university to get approval and to get construction documents and to get funding to get forward into the next phase. Uh, we've got a great plan for what we want to do to the arena. The arena has got to work on three different aspects, the curb appeal being the first one. Curb appeal means the way that you walk up to the stadium, the plaza outside, changing the face, changing the lobby, changing the roads around it, everything that takes place when you look at the outside of the arena. The second part of the arena is having a, a totally re renovated interior bowl of the arena that's going to have a 360-degree concourse, changes in concessions, changes in seating. Uh, we've got a great party deck that we're planning on putting in. We've got some donor hospitality spaces that will be a part of that. Um, that's probably the hardest lift of all of this is getting to that point um, of doing that. And then the third part is the addition of a practice facility for both men's and women's basketball, which is really important for them from a recruiting standpoint, from a retention standpoint, from a player development standpoint. But it also has a significant impact on the revenue possibilities with the arena. Uh, when the teams have a place to practice every day, when they have a place to work out every day, then the arena can be used as it's intended to be, which is an external place for both the outside community and the firm community to maximize the opportunities that would be inside. And I think it's kind of what they were trying to do with Timmons when they first built it the first time around. But anytime you try to build it that way where it's got the multi-purpose, it never really serves the purpose. We've got to make it a basketball arena first that can be used for other things. In terms of the process, it really comes down to funding. You know, We're at a point where we've done a lot of work in terms of leadership gifts and leadership cultivation, and we've got to land a leadership gift to get that out there to get this off the ground. We've had great fundraising support to date. You know, kind of the consistent figure for us that's been really a sweet spot has been a seven-figure contribution to the project. We've got to go out and identify an eight-figure pro prospect and gift that's going to get that process off the ground. The university's been very supportive. They've offered to, to fund a percentage of the project, which is a significant portion of the project as well. So we feel really strong support, but the work that we've got to get done next is going out and identifying a leadership donor to take this on. And the reality of a project of this size and scale is, is that's the key figure that will unleash the rest. Um, we feel very strongly about the seven-figure pool. We've had great support already from donors and trustees who have gotten behind this, and we're gonna, we feel that we're going to go through it. Uh, in terms of renderings, a lot of that's going to be taking place inside and they consider it a quiet phase of the funding process. And what that means is that we've got to work to solicit the gifts, to gain the enthusiasm, to get where we're going to get to until the university uh, uh, allows us to go public. And public really is uh, going through a process with your board of trustees where they say, yep, we're on board, we have the plans, let's go public with this, and we'll go to the next phase of it. But feel really good about it. I will say if, if you are passionate about this project, please call our fundraising staff. You know, If you want to reach out to Erin Wissing and her, her team, they'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, but the challenge for us is to raise substantial substantial dollars as a part of a fundraising process. We feel great about what we've done to date, and then we got to keep working it and go from there. I just have one request: when when we finally get there, put the basketball broadcast locations on the opposite side of the benches and scorers table because that is the best view for radio and television, largely because you don't have a coach's rear end in your face for 40 minutes. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. And, and, and that's, there's, um, you know, I've been through this process before, you know, I went from a, from a, being a part of an institution where the facility again was a lot like Timmons. It was a multi-purpose facility. that didn't serve the purpose. There's a lot of little things to make adjustments in Timmons that when you redo a building, you can do them the right way. And you, We've got great examples where we've looked at all, we've done the benchmarking, looking at other facilities in terms of who's done it right and where they've done it, um, but really confident we're going to do it. And Dan will take good care of you. We, <laughs> you know, we, I love hearing you. I, you know, I, I think I had a chance to listen to you recently, and, and uh, I, gave, I shot you a note after it. But um, you know, listen to you on the radio. The radio comes out very crisp, and we appreciate our ESPN Upstate partnership that gets it out there as well. But that's, I think it's a great question about, about Timmons. Yeah, and uh, to that uh – to, to that uh, end before we move on to something else. I want to be watching over the next week or two for uh, some news about Furman and ESPN Upstate. Some, good. Some good, good news. Yeah, we got, we, we got good news coming all the time. But, yeah, yeah that's great. Thank you, Dan. All right, let's, uh, let's move on quickly here. Next question, what changes, if any, would you like to see at the SOCON level, anything from broadcasting rights to maybe additions to the league specifically where football is concerned? And a lot of that conversation has come up because of the way the Big South has been blown up from a football standpoint. I think they have five teams remaining now. So what would you like to see? Are there any ongoing conversations you can share? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we just had our ADs winter meetings, and I will tell you that – 90% of the conversation was about football and basketball in this particular case. I'd say probably another 10% was about 
the NCAA Constitution stuff that I share with you just so we're all on the same page moving forward. But um, I feel really, really good about where we're heading in the Southern Conference with both football and basketball. Um, our league's done really, really strong work. Our commissioner and his team um, have really bought into what we're trying to accomplish in terms of those things. We feel very strongly about all of the sports that we offer. But in terms of the promotion of football and the work that we're doing, football specifically, when we talk about that, um, I had a chance to be a part of the regional advisory committee for the NCAA this past year, along with Scott Carter from ETSU, who was the chair, uh, who's done a great job of promoting our league. And we, we've done some strategic things with football to emphasize SOCON football to get it where we need to be. And some of the factors around us that affect us are, are good things. Um, the value of Furman's really strong. When you saw the statement that came out uh, about a week ago about the conference holding strong. One of the things that we were noticing is that our conference was susceptible to outside conferences that were trying to get schools, including Furman, to leave the Southern Conference to go elsewhere. So we had some substantial conversations about this uh, throughout last year that kind of culminated in the fall where us and the presidents, we all agreed that the best thing we could do in a, in a time of great uncertainty was to stick together, to double down on our league and work together for what we have. We've got great history, tradition. We've got a strong regional footprint. We've got like-minded schools. They're not all perfect. So one of the challenges that we have in our conference, one of the opportunities, we have great diversity. We've got state schools, academies, private schools. One of the challenges, we have diversity because we're different. Sometimes the playing field is not even level in our own conference relative to what we're doing. But we felt from a football and basketball brand standpoint, one of the most important things we could do is actually agree to stick together and to focus on that as a part of our model. The next side of the model is actually to look at the landscape of where we're headed. Some of the opportunities for the Southern Conference are going to develop because some of the schools that are competing at a high level when it comes to FCS football are leaving and they're going to the FBS. When you look at JMU and Jacksonville State and Sam Houston that are leaving, the discussions we've had are about how do we grow our league to not just be uh, you know, a championship and automatic qualifier, not just be a two-bid league. We've got to get to be a three-bid league. We, we've got to get to the point – where Southern Conference football is respected for the level of the way that we're playing and how we're going about it. Um, you, you look at just ETSU. ETSU wound up playing uh, you know, one of the eventual champions you know, in, in this process, and they played them as tough as anyone else. And feedback we're getting is, is we're right there relative to where we want to be. Uh, for Furman, we look at what do we need to do. You know, Furman, we're looking at it that we, with our Furman football team, want to compete as Southern Conference champions. We want to have the opportunity for at-large bid. We want to compete for FCS championships as well as in terms of that process. So a lot of the stuff that we're spending time on is going to be the marketing, the broadcasting, um, the growth and promotion of the league, the work that we need to do with the media, the work that we need to do with other conferences, uh, the work that we need to do with the other committees. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to quality on the field. And we've got to continue to promote what that quality is for the Southern Conference. Um, I think, and this is in conversations with, with, with Clay and conversations with some of our alumni, I think the Southern Conference took a little bit of a hit when you lost those three national championship programs that had jumped up. And when you look at losing an App State, look, losing a Georgia Southern when they made those moves, I think over time it took a reputational hit and we're rebuilding that on the football side. Ironically, it, may, it mirrors a lot of the strategies that have taken place on the basketball side. Uh, a lot of the things that have been done around basketball, one of the, things, one of the biggest things has been a change in the ESPN contract uh, that has allowed us to have more national exposure through ESPN. Uh, one of the things that I'm enjoying myself is the CBS broadcast on the weekends that you have a CBS game of the week. The exposure we had when we played Chattanooga was huge. I think the next game versus Chattanooga should be on national TV, and we got to figure out how to not just distribute games in the membership, but also to distribute them to the best games that have the most impact when we look at the league. And those are things that we're working on together. Um, the marketing, the exposure, the commitment to scheduling, I know that comes up a lot. Uh, that was a conversation around football. You know, wh What are the things that we need to do uh, scheduling-wise? Uh, for me, I don't want to play non-D1 teams. The challenge we have in the South is we don't always have the ability to schedule a home game. There aren't enough games that are here. When you look at schools that are playing in the Northeast, uh, they've got the advantage of playing a Patriot League or playing an Ivy League. There's more schools playing Division One football that are in that region. So we've got to look at scheduling the same as we did with basketball. But if you notice with Bob Ritchie, he made the commitment. This is over several, several years of conversations. He committed to playing a tougher non-conference schedule so that if you're sitting there on a Monday night in a Southern Conference tournament and you're not the automatic qualifier winner, that you can say, did we do enough to qualify for the NCAA? Did we do enough to qualify for the NIT? Did we do enough to qualify for postseason? Those are the same conversations we're having with Clay Hendricks and the same conversations we're having with the other ADs in the league. So I think this is all moving in a really strong direction relative to where it's going to go. It's going to be continued progress. I know one of the other questions we can answer at this time as well, um, someone asked about these multi-tournament multi, multi -tournament teams. Uh, they're 100% on. 
I, I've been pushing this since I got here. The part of the Southern Conference challenge is we've got to we've got to bump another conference out of a multi-team tournament and allow us to be in it. We were supposed to be in it last year during the COVID year. We had the opportunity to be on an ESPN broadcast national tournament. In Myrtle Beach, we, we've got to get back to those opportunities, and they got to go to the best teams in the league. So, if Furman basketball is preseason rated at the high, highest part of the league, we need the conference to help us set that up just as much as we've got to set it up. But it's got to come from the conference, and we've got to have an opportunity to be in there as one of the best teams in the league, representing the Southern Conference on a national stage for three games a year. So, that is part of the process. It's the same thing for us internally. You know, when you talk about questions and things that we want to accomplish. Um, I'm really excited about next year's basketball schedule. You know, the, the things that Bob did, uh, it wasn't just go play a game. It was home and home. You know, this is an opportunity for us to not only go on the road and play a great game against a Belmont, but for them to return the game the next year. You know, we're going through the same thing with games that we had at home this year. We got some great home games this year. Well, we got to go return them. You know, and that's part of the process of, of being a mid-major basketball program with national aspirations is you've got to play a more competitive schedule. One of the goals that we have, and we're working through this, is to get to the point of drawing a North Carolina, a Virginia, a Villanova, um, uh, you know, a Notre Dame, a school that will play us in Greenville at the well, and to look at scheduling opportunities that come around with that. We were making progress on that before COVID. When COVID hit, a lot of the schools that had considered it, they had to go back to contractual obligations that they made mm -hmm. before it. So um, as we go through this NCAA tournament, one of the advantages of hosting it, you know, we're hoping to have the best possible talent in Greenville when we host the NCAA tournament. We're hoping to parlay that into an opportunity to get teams back here because those teams aren't playing us in Timmins. It doesn't matter what you say or what you do. They're just not, they're just not doing it. But they will consider playing us in Greenville for the opportunity uh, for that exposure. And then we've got to do our part on the scheduling side. So there's a commitment to be aggressive. And there's a commitment here for us to continue to invest in that brand um, it's just like we, you know, we announced the schedule today. Like We're excited to go at Clemson. That's what we want. That's what we want to do. Uh, we want to play against the best of the best, and we want to beat the best of the best. That's our goal at Furman. Um, it's been done in the past, and our coaches have proven that we can do this on a national level in all the sports that we offer. If only we knew somebody who knew somebody at Villanova. <laughs> right? Well, here, here, I'll tell you this. So this is funny. So, so Dan's going to tease me about trying to get the Villanova game down here. I will tell you I made the call. And I asked directly, and I said, would you consider playing us in Greenville? And they laughed. And the reason they laughed is because before I got here, Bob went up to, to Villanova and beat them. So part of yeah. the challenge we have is, is our coaches have been really, really good. You know? And you, know, you look at the national success that Bob's had. Like, you know, the, the AD at Louisville is a friend of mine. You know, when we got that game, they, they did us a solid. You know, they had a relationship with our basketball program. They had a relationship with me. We got a game at Louisville. We got a national win. They – they texted me before the game. They said, your team's really good. They were nervous. You know, that was a great win for us. But relationships in this sport do matter. Opportunities do matter. Um, I will go back to them and ask again, but I, I know what they said. <laughs> I mean, part of Bob's success is also part of your hindrance. And yeah. I think, you know, if we weren't a good program, teams would consider playing us because they, they do look at it competitively. They, they want to get as many wins as they can. But publicly, like, our, you know, our people will criticize some of the state schools near us well, why won't you play Furman? Well, they don't want to play Furman because they don't want to lose to Furman, and mm -hmm. they don't want to lose to the team in the area. So the guys that are doing scheduling on the other side know what the deal is, and they got to answer to a boss too. They got to answer to a head coach. They got to answer to an athletic director relative to where they are competitively. And why is Furman doing so well? You get the same issue in football. We we have a hard time scheduling games in football because of Furman's history in football. People don't want to play Furman in football because they they run a risk with Furman. Um, but we're excited about the schedule that we have, and we're excited to have Clemson. We're excited to have South Carolina. We're excited to get back to Tennessee. We're going to get that game back on the back end of our schedule, and, um, and we look forward to announcing that in the public. But those games are in play. We're excited to go play Florida. You know, we want to play Billy Napier. We want to play against them. And some of this is on a hold. Some of these mm -hmm. scheduling things, the public needs to know that some of these things are on a hold because college football is in a transition right now. Yeah. So. Some of these things we're all going to have to wait. It's not Furman. It's all of us got to wait to figure out where this is all headed. I, I got to tell you, I don't know if I told you this, but after the Louisville game, I've been doing this in one form or another for 36, 37 years now. I have never seen this. We wrapped up Bob's interview on the postgame radio, and as Tom and I were getting into wrap-up mode, two Louisville fans came over and asked Bob to take a picture yeah. with them. Yeah, I, I've never seen opposing fans want to take a picture unless there was an existing relationship. But th this would just 
two fans who wanted their picture taken with Furman's coach that just coached the team that beat their team. Yeah, and I hope the public knows how fortunate we are to have Bob as our coach and his commitment level to Furman. We, the last two years, we fought off some serious suitors to keep him. You know, the people that have come after him um, and arguably have been able to offer him more resources, more money. Um, Bob's commitment to Furman has been strong. Um, every, team, every time that he goes out and has this success against other teams, both in and out of our conference and nationally, you know, there's a lot to it. And um, having been really tied in with that community in terms of what he is, he's the real deal, um, and we're very proud to have him. The same thing we go through with Clay Hendricks. Clay Hendricks is the real deal, um, and people in the football community know that. So you're, you're working through progress. The results, they're going to vary year to year in terms of what you have and where you go. Um, but the, the identity that you see right now with Furman basketball is a really special thing that he's been building for several years, and the identity is on both sides of the floor. And when you start to have that identity, special things start to happen. So it, it, you get lightning in a bottle when you do all the right things. You have the right people in place to make those decisions. We're very thankful for the coaches we have, the student-athletes that we have. You know, one thing that, that I like about a guy like Jason is we've got this whole list of questions here, and in the process of answering one or two questions, he's answered three or four others. I can just scratch off my list, and it helps us get through. We've, we've, we've been going for a little over an hour now, so we probably yep. need to start getting in a wrap-up mode and save some of these for the next time out. But a uh, little, little rapid fire here, if, if you're capable of doing that. Uh, Lighting, that was a question here yeah. at Paladin Stadium. We had the night game. They had to bring in the temporary lights to supplement. That's been an issue about playing night games here in the past. Question is, anything being done about that? Yes. Yeah. We, so we played the night games here strategically this past year based on feedback from our students and our fans about playing night games. And we also want to play them earlier uh, in the calendar, not later in the year. Sometimes there's some obstacles to that. We're going to play a night game here next year. Uh, we are committed to getting to the point of upgrading those lights. I didn't know that was an issue until I got here, but the lights are not of the quality that you need to host night game football games. So we brought in lights to support that. Uh, we have had donor conversations relative to that and internal conversations relative to lighting. But, yes, that is a priority, something that we're working on uh, and something that we want to upgrade. And uh, we're planning to continue to play night games here as well. Uh, you you talked about the basketball team having to return some of those games home and home or, or Winthrop and App State uh, is Winthrop coming here next year, and are we going to App State is the question. Yeah, you're going to see the reverse on a lot of the games that we hosted. So an App State's a return, a Winthrop's a return, but we're going to get Belmont coming in here. we got somebody else coming in here as well. But what we what High the, Point maybe? High Point. High yeah. Point. we got Tubby Smith coming in here as well. So um, we've got a number of great games that are coming to us, and we've got a number of great games that we're going to go to them. And, again, that's where I really trust and believe in our staff because they're making strategic partnerships with, with schools in our region that are great games for us. And then – we will focus on the remainder of our schedule in terms of who we play and where we play them and what we do. Um, but we're going to schedule aggressively again with our basketball program relative to where we are. And you also need those rhythm games. You know, sometimes you get a game and, you know, you, you think it's going to be an easier opportunity than it is, but the team needs to have home games. They need to have rhythm as a part of their schedule. Uh, so we got to work on that as well in terms of finding that rhythm. But, yes, we're, they're going to be home and homes for those games that you mentioned, plus return games coming back to us. And given the right opportunity, we will look to play more games down at the well. Um, the well has gotten great feedback for us. Again, we're in a COVID time, so it doesn't really show what the potential is. Timing and games and atmosphere and all that thing comes together. But uh, as we look ahead to the Wofford game being potentially the atmosphere that it was the last time that we played there, the goal is to pack that out. I mean, it, it, the NCAA tournament site is one of the first to sell out. And um, it's not because of Furman. You know, there, there's other schools in this region that support that. you got Duke and Kentucky potentially playing here as well. But Furman's a big part of that as well in terms of where we're growing. The strategy with the well is growth in Greenville. You know, we've got to continue to commit to that in terms of where we're going to go. Our challenges for us with our basketball program are growing our fan base and improving our facilities. And if you do those things, we've got a great product on the floor that can continue to support that. But it does take time. Um, it's not an overnight process. It's just like one of the questions – Someone had, I noticed, and I, I didn't have a chance to read through this. I just had a chance to look at it real quick. Um, was about metal detectors at the stadiums. It's, it's a legitimate question. Part of our responsibility here on campus is not just to operate alone in athletics, but also to listen to our campus partners. So at the end of every season, we do an evaluation. We look at all the things that we're doing well. Uh, we look at the things that we need to improve. And one of the things that needed to be improved was just general safety and risk management. It's just one of those things when you look at uh, having an a stadium that is holding 10,000 people for a game. There's a responsibility on the safety side that there's some things that we've got to do to ensure the safety of the general public. There's never been any issues or any threats. Um, and you kind of go through the process and like, could you get away with that? Yeah, you could probably get away with not doing it. 
But when you have an issue, you look back and say, why didn't we do those things? So uh, preventative safety measures have been built in for both football and basketball to do that. And that's really just more about the safety of the, of the people that are attending our games to make sure that everyone's in a good spot. But we're in a, we're in a safe community, but we just can't take things for granted. Well, I, I go back. It, it's, it's different, but it's the same uh, back to the North Carolina A&T, the home football opener this year. You know, we've got ambulances in outside of each end zone uh, for every football game and, and almost never have to use them. Yep. But in the opener this year, three plays into the season, we had to use one because a North Carolina A&T player – got hurt uh, to the point that they had to strap him down on the board to keep his neck from moving. Thankfully, he was okay. But you, it, it's preventative medicine, preventative maintenance, liability, whatever you want to call it. You have to be prepared in case something happens, praying that it never does. Right, and that what, what people don't necessarily get to see is the unsung heroes of our department, you being one of them. There's people that do a lot of the work behind the scenes. Um, but when you look at the work that Todd Duke and operations staff does, his number one responsibility – on game day is safety, is to make sure that, that our fans are safe, that they have a, they have a first-class experience, that they have all the different accommodations that they need. But it starts, the conversation starts with safety. Uh, John Milby and our campus safety team participate in that. we got a great thing going. It's the same thing with Elaine Baker and Craig, Craig Clark and our sports medicine staff. They do a phenomenal job of making sure that there's policies, procedures, and practice in place to prevent those things. That was a scary, scary thing. I mean, we, we potentially had someone that was going to lose their life on our football field and, um, and our staff did a great job of stepping in and making sure all those things were in place. And the only issue we had in that particular case is that both teams cared enough to come out to that student athlete and support him and surround him, and it actually got a little overwhelming. So yeah. they had to talk about, hey, you can't even go on the field for that because this person potentially could have lost their life, and we need space. Mm -hmm. um, so students, athletes with integrity were down on a knee and around them, and it got a little scary even for the staff that was working on it. But um, we can't take those things for granted, and we've got to continue to emphasize those things. And – and God willing, you hope you never need them. You know, it's like a fire marshal at the basketball games and, and, and having those things in place. Well, you hope you never need them, but God forbid when you do, you need to be prepared and you need to support the people that make those decisions to, to let them do their jobs accordingly. Do we still owe Loyola Chicago a basketball game? I don't think we do. I think that game got – that the game was supposed to be returned during the COVID year, um, and, and quite honestly, I don't, I don't think they really wanted it or needed it. Mm -hmm. um, contractually, some games that were put out there, there's games we never even announced, things we were working on um, that got gobbled up by COVID. But uh, in talking to our basketball staff, I don't think we need to return it. I think if they really wanted it and they wanted to push on it, we, could, we would do it. But I'm not even sure if they really want to play us um, based on where we've been. But, no, I don't think we're going to return that game. We got through just about everything. And, like I say, we're about an hour and 15 minutes in, and we know what uh, – um, attention spans are these days. So we probably need to hold everything else over, and, and I'm sure we'll have some additional questions next month. But it's uh, always good to catch up. It was good to get a chance to know Kirkland. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, for, for the first time she and I met, and she was just an absolute joy. Yes, you know, we're really blessed. Um, you know, The best part of our department is the people, and we've got first-rate coaches in every sport in terms of everything we do. We've got great commitment from our student-athletes. And, again, I, I, I'm excited for the spring ahead. We're excited for everyone to tune in and join us. Um, we've got a great February ahead. Uh, if you can join us on Saturdays, you know, this Saturday at the Well, next Saturday at Timmins, uh, the following Saturday at the Well, mm -hmm. the next that Saturday is Women's Basketball Senior Night. There's a lot of great things to jump on. Um, join us for the Southern Conference Tournament. We need your support in Asheville. That's, that's something that we have not yet got to is getting to that point, but we need a home crowd atmosphere in Asheville. We need our fans to be up there with us to help us guide us through for both the men's and women's programs. And, and then we're getting into the NCAA Tournament, you know, and we're planning to participate, and we're going to host the NCAA Tournament. And I'm preparing our staff that we're going to host an event, you know, here for the NCAA, but we're also planning to participate in it. And we're looking forward to an exciting spring football game. Or we're going to have great activities with all of our spring sports and the things we're going to do there. But we're, we're excited where Furman Athletics is headed, and we're, we're excited to be in 2022. But we appreciate your support, Dan, appreciate the public, and look forward to doing this again sometime soon. Yeah, next month, right? It's on the yeah. schedule somewhere. Sounds good, yeah. <laughs> That'll do it. I, I do want to say this. You know, last week we came through the annual coaches versus cancer games. Uh, that's why you saw basketball coaches in suits and sneakers. Uh, and, and just a, a reminder that we have two in our firm and family here who are battling that terrible disease. I actually talked to Jordan Kasky right before we started recording this week's edition of Inside Furman Athletics and happy to report that he said that uh, you know his treatment's been over for about three weeks now. They said he had six to eight recovery weeks before they can then see where his numbers and, and everything are. But he told me that he finally ate something solid for the first time over the weekend 
and that's helped him feel so much better. Uh, and then, of course, Tracy Davis from the, our Tim and staff, who was in the early stages uh, of her battle with lung cancer. So our thoughts and prayers go out to them, and just uh, just keep them in mind. And uh, if you could drop them a card or a note, if you see Todd Duke, say, hey, make sure you tell Tracy uh, we're thinking about her. I'll pass along notes to Jordan, but... Uh, couple of folks who are in very significant fights right now, and we, we just want them to know that uh, the Furman family is thinking about them and loves them. Yeah, I, I second that. We had a really nice gathering uh, this past Wednesday for the coaches, uh, suits and sneakers, and um, and everybody came and brought a card and, and, and thoughts you know, for Tracy and for mm-hmm. Jordan and helping them out. So anything that you can do, your prayers are, are definitely appreciated during this time and the support. They feel it. They feel the – you know, Tracy sent me a picture with her uh, you know, at the hospital with the Furman family T-shirt on it, and – it's real, and Jordan, we can't wait to get both of them back here with us. Yeah, Tracy's got great spirit. She posted a, a photo on Facebook, I think it was the other day. She said, I haven't lost my hair yet, but how do you like this wig? She was already <laughs> modeling already modeling a wig, but uh, uh, just keep them in your thoughts and prayers. We will be back again next week with uh, another edition of Inside Furman Athletics, still working to confirm the guest. We're thinking it may be Matt Davidson. But uh, waiting to get that confirmed, and then uh, Jason will be back with us sometime uh, next month or at the end of this month, whatever is on the schedule. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Dan. This has been Inside Furman Athletics. And uh, until then, for Jason Donnelly, the athletic director, and Kirkland Lewis, who was our guest in the first part of the show, I'm Dan Scott saying God bless you, and so long, everybody.